exchanges. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us uh, for this meeting. And please type all of your questions on the Q&A chat box. We are going to be very glad to answer all of your questions in the end of, of this meeting with this amazing panelist that we have today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to say one or two words. Am, am, I, uh, am I on? Yes, Dr. Anderson. You, you okay. Can. So I just want to say one or two words before we start today's session on common arterial trunk. Because as Grace has intimated, the uh, next session is supposed to be on discordant atrioventricular connections. Well, discordant atrioventricular connections are a complicated topic. And we were going to start the introduction to that by telling you that congenitally corrected transposition is the triumph of sequential segmental analysis. Now, I've become well aware over the past few weeks that the material we present to you becomes increasingly complicated. So to set the scene for what we are going to be discussing with regard to congenitally corrected transposition, and then the sessions that we're going to be putting on during the month of May, which will be devoted to transposition, double outlet right ventricle and isomerism, we want to introduce you to the problems that exist between understanding segmental approach and the sequential segmental approach. So next week's presentation will be an introduction, the starting point for the understanding of discordant atrioventricular connections. And that is then going to be the first of our next four series of presentations. So please join us next week for a much simpler introduction. We have a saying in English that every cloud has a silver lining. We're all still suffering under the huge cloud of COVID. It's not going away anyway, so anytime soon. Many of you are in your third waves, which is terrible. But if we have a silver lining, it is what we are achieving within the Congenital Heart Academy. So we anticipate that we're going to be having several more sessions within the Congenital Heart Academy. So we need to set the scene so you can understand what we're talking about. So next week, as I say, will be the introduction for the four sessions that will follow during May. But now, common arterial trunk. So Sasha, get us going with common arterial trunk. Okay. Well, good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. So as you will see this afternoon, we're going to be discussing common arterial trunk. I'm sure many of you will still be considering this as truncus arteriosus. I hope I can persuade you that it is much better to think of it in terms of the common arterial trunk. And the major reason is what you see on the screen at the moment. We are describing an arterial trunk leaving the base of the heart through a common arterial valve supplying directly the aortic, pulmonary, and coronary arterial pathways. The major feature here is that the phenotypic feature is the commonality of the ventricular arterial junction. So that is why we should be thinking of it as common. So this is what we're going to be talking about. I opened one of Diane's specimens to show you the anatomy, Diane will be joining me throughout today's discussions as over the past few weeks, we're going to show you video presentations to illustrate the salient anatomy. So this is what we are looking at today, the commonality of the ventricular arterial junction that is guarded by a common truncal valve. So that you see arising from the common trunk, we have the systemic arteries, on the back of the trunk, we see the origins of the two pulmonary arteries, and also arising directly from the trunk here with a high origin, we have the coronary arteries, specifically the left coronary artery. So 
I've emphasized the tronco valve guards the ventricular arterial junction. But now today we'd like to emphasize another feature. Because what we are going to do today, we are going to compare the situation raised by a common ventricular arterial junction with what you know happens when we have a common atrioventricular junction. In other words, atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. And the point we want to make is that when you have that common ventricular arterial junction, then the defect with which it is associated has ventricular and arterial components. It's comparable to the defect we see in the setting of an atrioventricular septal defect that has atrial and ventricular components. So let's look at the consequences of thinking this of this as an atrioventricular septal defect and then a ventriculo arterial septal defect. Now we've discussed this several times. And this is what we're going to make comparisons with today. What I'm showing you here are the variants that we find when we have atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. And you are all well aware that in the majority of these hearts, the bridging leaflet of the common atrioventricular valve floats within the atrioventricular septal defect. And that means there is the potential for shunting at atrial level. There's the potential for shunting at ventricular level. So we have the potential for shunting through this atrioventricular septal defect at two levels. But you also know that one of the variants of atrioventricular septal defect is when the bridging leaflets are attached to the crest of the scooped out ventricular septum. This means that the shunting is confined at atrial level. Now, many of you still call this the ostium primum atrial septal defect, but it is not an atrial septal defect. It is an atrioventricular septal defect, but it permits shunting only at atrial level. And you then know that the rarest variant in which there is shunting through an atrioventricular septal defect is when the bridging leaflets, as I've shown you here, are attached to the underside of the atrial septum. That is confining the shunting at ventricular level. And this is the true ventricular septal defect of atrioventricular canal type because there is a common atrioventricular junction and the shunting through the atrioventricular septal defect is confined at ventricular level. So what we are going to do today is to show you how you can take exactly the same approach to hearts that have a ventriculo arterial septal defect. And this is the essence of the ventriculo arterial septal defect. So I'm going to draw you a picture of it here. And there you see the common ventricular arterial junction that we've already said is the essence of common arterial trunk. And there is our ventriculo arterial septal defect. And as you see, when you compare the two pictures, the truncal valvar leaflets in most instances are, as it were, floating within the ventricular arterial septal defect, and they are separating it into arterial components and ventricular components. Here we're looking at a common arterial trunk as it leaves the ventricular mass. And this common trunk will supply the systemic, the pulmonary, and the coronary circulation. Many cases with common arterial trunk, or I should say most cases, have concordant atrioventricular connections and usual atrial arrangement as we have here with a morphologically right atrial appendage and atrium to the right and a morphologically left atrial appendage and atrium to the left. When we look inside of this common arterial trunk, the pulmonary arteries bifurcate from the common trunk very close to one another from the posterior lateral aspect. And here we can see a very high takeoff of the left coronary artery.
what you'll note is that there is no notice of an aorta pulmonary septum in this case and formation of this septum during development will delineate the variations we see within this group of common arterial trunks. The common truncal valve is bicuspid in this case, so we have one leaflet here and the second leaflet here that is formed secondary to poor formation of the interleaflet triangle, leaving us with this raphe at the base of the sinus. The common ventriculo arterial junction in a common arterial trunk can be compared to a common atrioventricular junction in those cases with atrioventricular septal defect. Those cases have atrial and ventricular components, while these cases have arterial and ventricular components. The ventricular septal defect or interventricular communication is juxta arterial in common arterial trunks and also is an outlet defect as it lies between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. Here the caudal limb is intact and joins the ventricular and fundibular fold in normal fashion, allowing for the membranous septum to remain intact and this muscle bar will protect the conduction axis when this case is surgically repaired. The caudal arm joining the ventriculo and fundibular fold also separates the arterial valve from the atrioventricular valve. This particular common arterial trunk is approximately one half committed to the left ventricle and one half committed to the right ventricle and this will vary throughout the cases that you'll see uh, or that we'll look at today. When we look at the left ventricular side we can see the interventricular communication forming the left component of the outflow tract. When the surgeon repairs this ventricular septal defect from the right, he will use those borders from the right and put the patch in this area, effectively creating a new left ventricular outflow tract and closing this defect to the right ventricle. So now you've seen what we're going to be looking at, common arterial trunk. We're going to be considering that in the setting of the ventricular arterial septal defect. But I've already intimated that many of you probably still think of this as persistent truncus. But do we really know what is the embryonic truncus? Now, those of you who have been watching our presentations for the Academy of the past few months will know that we've already considered this in the setting of development of the outro tract. So let me recap recapitulate for you what we now know about the way the outro tract develops. And you will remember, if you've been watching these presentations before, that we compare development of the outflow tract to what we see in the postnatal heart. And you all know now, when we consider the outflow tracts in the postnatal heart, and here I am showing you the outflow tract of the right ventricle, we think of them in tripartite fashion. So we see very nicely in this oblique subcostal equivalent of the right ventricular outflow tract that we see the subpulmonary infundibulum, you all know now, that is a freestanding infundibular sleeve. And then in the middle of the outflow tract, we have the pulmonary root. Beyond the sinutubular junction, we have the pulmonary trunk, and that extends to the margins of the pericardial cavity. So, taking note of the intrapericardial, the extrapericardial components, we can say that within the pericardium, we have the subvalvar ventricular outlets, the arterial roots, the intrapericardial arterial trunks. Beyond the pericardium, we see the extrapericardial arterial pathways. So, can development be considered in comparable tripartite fashion, recognizing also that we have those extrapericardial components? And you know, if you have been watching, previous presentations that this is indeed the case.
So this is a reconstruction of a developing human heart. This was made quite some time ago. Now it's work I did with Alexander Cesarov when he was in Amsterdam working with Anton Moorman. And this is a reconstruction of a human heart at Carnegie stage 13. And here you see the outro tract. At this early stage, it has exclusively myocardial borders, but we can recognize it as having proximal, intermediate, distal components. And then at the margins of the outflow tract, it becomes continuous with the aortic sac. And we know that the same thing happens in the developing mouse heart. So here's a nice reconstruction made by my other friend and colleague, Simon Bamforth, who works in Newcastle, of an episcopic data set from a mouse heart. So there are the extra pericardial components. We're not going to be talking about those today but we have discussed them previously. And percolating through the pharyngeal mesenchyme, you see the arteries of the pharyngeal arches. But it is within the pericardial cavity that we are concerned today. And at the margins of the pericardial cavity, at this stage, we have an undivided distal outflow tract. And then spiraling through the middle and proximal parts of the outflow tract, we have the cushions. So what we are going to now consider is how we can relate what we know about development to the division of that ventricular arterial defect and how it can be produce separation of the levels of arterial valvar and subvalvar levels. And I would put it to you that we cannot do this adequately if we think of it only in terms of truncus and conus. And that is why I dislike the notion that we can have persistent truncus arteriosus. So many of you will have seen these pictures before. This is an early mouse heart. This is the stage at which the distal part remains undivided. There you see the margins of the pericardial cavity, but already the distal outflow tract has become non-myocardial. We can recognize the development of the channels that will come the intrapericardial aorta, the intrapericardial pulmonary trunk. But dividing these components is a partition that is growing into the distal outflow tract from the back wall of the aortic sac. And this is the aortopulmonary septum. There you see the distal end of the cushions. And between the two at this stage, we have an aortopulmonary foramen. If that persists, it will form an aortopulmonary window. The key point, the aortopulmonary septum is dividing and separating the distal part of the outflow tract. And if all goes well, that aortopulmonary septum separating the parietal intrapericardial aorta and the parietal intrapericardial pulmonary trunk will fuse with those cushions and will divide the distal outflow tract into the intrapericardial artery trunks. So the cushions separate the middle and the proximal parts of the outflow tract. And if we look at a cross-section of the middle part, you can see very nicely how the cushions fuse in the middle, separating the arterial roots. So it is the distal part of those cushions that separates the middle part of the outflow tract to form the arterial roots. And then if we look at the proximal part of the outflow tract, having separated the aortic root from the pulmonary root, we see the proximal part of the cushions. And you all know, we've been discussing at length how these cushions fuse and they build a shelf in the roof of the right ventricle and that commits the aortic root to the left ventricle. So in normal development, those proximal cushions muscularize, as you see here, to form the infundibulum, and that separates out from the aortic root. So how can we put all of this together to understand the morphogenesis of common arterial trunk? And we can put it together because we know it is the failure of those fusions of the outflow cushions that produces common arterial trunk. We know that because in a colony of mouse in which the TBX1 gene has been knocked out, 
all of them have common artery trunk. And here is one of our episcopic data sets from such a mouse. There is the common trunk. But we know it remains common because the entirety of the cushions have failed to fuse. The distal cushions have not separated the arterial roots. The proximal cushions have not separated the ventricular outflow tracts. So here you see the potential three parts of what we are going to be considering as a ventricular artery defect. The arterial part, common trunk, the middle part, the distal cushions, the ventricular part should be separated by the proximal cushions. And this is important because even when the cushions themselves have failed to fuse and remember they separate the middle part, the proximal part, it is still possible for the autopulmonary septum to separate the intrapericardial part. And we know that because we have access to other genetically modified mice. These are the mice that Dr. Mohan perturbed by knocking out the furin enzyme. And in both of these mice, you see there is the common valve guarding a common trunk, but both of them have formation of an aortopulmonary septum. And to your left hand, you see the situation in which the aortopulmonary septum has separated balanced intrapericardial components, whereas to your right hand, you see the situation in which there is pulmonary dominance, there is persistence of the arterial duct, and there is interruption of the aortic arch. And we're going to show you the influence of formation of the autopulmonary septum, even in the situation when the cushions themselves have failed to separate the middle and proximal parts so that we have common arterial trunk with common ventriculo arterial junction. So what we're also going to show you is that it is the extent of the separation that is produced by the aortopulmonary septum that gives us the major variation. And that is aortic as opposed to pulmonary dominance. So Diane is now going to show you two hearts when we illustrate this con concept of aortic as opposed to pulmonary dominance of the common arterial trunk. This is an aorta dominant common arterial trunk. And here is our common arterial trunk as it leaves the ventricular mass. The right coronary exits anteriorly and extends into the right atrioventricular groove. The aortic arch was to the left and the brachiocephalic arteries branch in normal fashion. If I open the common arterial trunk, we can see that there is no aorta pulmonary septum as we saw in the pulmonary dominant common arterial trunk. And we have our systemic pulmonary and coronary blood flow all supplied via the common arterial trunk. The pulmonary arteries bifurcate in this specimen in separate fashion and the coronary, the left coronary I should say, bifurcates near one of the valvar commissures. The valve has three relatively thin leaflets in this case and the ventricular septal defect or the interventricular communication is again an outlet defect within the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation and here we see that the caudal limb is intact and making its connection with the ventriculo infundibular fold. This specimen has the lungs attached and I've reflected the right atrial appendage so that we can see the common arterial trunk exiting the ventricular mass. Here's the right coronary exiting anteriorly and extending into the right atrioventricular groove. This is a pulmonary dominant common arterial trunk and there are separate intrapericardial channels in this case. So that the patterning of these separate intrapericardial channels depends on the extent of the aorta pulmonary septum during de development. And this ascending aortic component bifurcates into the right and left carotid arteries. And as is typical with pulmonary dominant common arterial trunks, there is an interrupted aortic arch. So that the interruption occurs between the left carotid and the left subclavian arteries. The aortic arch extended to the left and there was distal origin 
of the right subclavian in this case, but it was truncated very close to its aortic bifurcation. When we look at the arterial duct, this case has a small arterial duct that joins the descending aorta. The pulmonary dominant component of the common trunk is a bit redundant in this case. The left pulmonary artery bifurcates on its own from the left lateral aspect, and the right pulmonary artery bifurcates as well on its own from the posterior lateral aspect. The aortic bifurcation is very low within the common trunk and almost has a sinusal origin. So that the ventriculo-arterial communication in this case is from where the aortic component bifurcates from the common trunk to the crest of the interventricular septum that's associated with the interventricular communication. The arterial valve has four mildly dysplastic leaflets and there is a coronary orifice exiting right above one of the commissures. The ventricular septal defect or interventricular communication is perimembranous in this case so that there is fibrous continuity along the posterior inferior aspect between the tricuspid and mitral valves as well both of the atrioventricular valves are in fibrous continuity with the common arterial trunk valve. This is the typical appearance of the interventricular communication in all common arterial trunks so that it is an outlet defect because it lies between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. As I've already mentioned, it is perimembranous because the caudal arm does not reach the ventricular infundibular fold, and the defect is juxta-arterial. Here the common arterial trunk is partially committed to the left ventricle, but mostly committed within the right ventricle. So now what we'd like to show you is how we can take account of this separation of the distal part of the outflow tract by the autopulmonary septum, the cushions themselves separating the intermediate part, the middle part, and the ventricular part, how we can think of that in the setting of a ventricular arterial septal defect. So let me remind you again how we can consider the common ventricular arterial junction in a fashion as we have considered the common atrioventricular junction. So there to your left hand, you see the commonest example of common arterial trunk where we have a ventricular arterial defect that has both a ventricular component and an arterial component. If, however, the middle part of the outflow tract has separated properly, giving us separate aortic and pulmonary roots, we have a defect that is part still of that ventricular arterial initial defect. And this is the juxta arterial ventricular septal defect. And what Diane is going to show you very shortly is that this is remarkably similar to the defect we see in the setting of common arterial trunk. What she's also going to show you is that very rarely those cushions can separate so as to produce right separate orifices within the middle part of the outflow tract, but they confuse to the crest of the ventricular septum. So then, despite the fact that there can be separation of the intrapericardial components by the aortopulmonary septum, we still have shunting present exclusively at arterial level. And this is that very rare variant of common arterial trunk with intact ventricular septum. So Diane now will show you these variants emphasizing how we can also consider common ventricular arterial junction in the setting of the ventricular arterial septal defect. This is a typical common arterial trunk with aortic dominance. We can see the pulmonary 
component bifurcating very low and nearly within a velvar sinus. There are the coronary arteries, which are lying behind this very dysplastic quadricuspid common truncal valve. And what we need to appreciate here is that there are arterial and ventricular components to this common ventriculo-arterial junction. The ventricular septal defect or the interventricular communication in this case is quite restrictive, but we can appreciate that there is shunting taking place at both the ventricular and the arterial level. This interventricular communication is perimembranous because there's fibrous continuity between the tricuspid and the mitral valves along the posterior inferior border. Here we're looking at two separate arterial trunks leaving the ventricular mass. So the pulmonary trunk and the aorta and they are spiraling in normal fashion. Looking at the right ventricular outflow tract we see there is a ventricular septal defect and it is an outlet defect as it lies within the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. This defect is perimembranous because the caudal arm does not reach the ventriculo-infundibular fold and allows for fibrous continuity between the tricuspid and the mitral valve along the posterior inferior rim. At the roof of the defect we see the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve in fibrous continuity with one another. The defect is doubly committed and juxta-arterial and in this case there is only shunting at the ventricular level because we have two separate arterial trunks. The defect in this specimen is very reminiscent of the defect we see with common arterial trunk. I'm going to begin this segment by looking at a heart that has an atrioventricular septal defect with two separate orifices. So the primum type of atrioventricular septal defect. There's our oval fossa and our coronary sinus and here we see the leading edge of the atrial septum. The ventricular septum has the bridging leaflets adherent to one another across the septum and to the septum itself. If we tilt this specimen up, we can see that there is a right component and a left component to this common atrioventricular valve. So that the extent of the shunting of this atrioventricular septal defect is only at the atrial level. I'm going to compare this very interesting common arterial trunk with the last specimen we looked at that had a common atrioventricular junction with exclusively atrial shunting. So here we have a common arterial trunk arising from the ventricular mass with separate intrapericardial components. So the aortic and pulmonary components are of relatively equal size. There's a large patent arterial duct and the aortic arch extended to the left. The brachiocephalic arteries branch normally from the arch and you'll note that there is some degree of aortic arch hypoplasia in this case. When we open the common trunk, the left and right pulmonary arteries bifurcate separately from the posterior lateral aspect and there is the aortic opening to the common trunk. Looking at the interventricular septum, we'll see that it is intact in this case. The septomarginal trabeculation gives rise to its caudal arm which connects to the ventriculo-infundibular fold so that there's the medial papillary muscle and here the cephalic arm rises up to support the common truncal valve. Again there is an intact ventricular septum. If we look at the valvar component, we see that there are separate right and separate left orifices. The right orifice has been opened and this is very reminiscent of the last heart with a common atrioventricular junction with the bridging leaflets adherent across the crest of the septum.
looking at this common arterial valve from above shows us that the bridging leaflets separated into right and left components much like those hearts with the primum type of atrioventricular septal defect. This is comparable in that those hearts have shunting only available at the atrial level, whereas this heart has shunting only available at the arterial level. The bridging leaflets adherent to one another across the crest of the septum have separated the valve into two separate orifices, right and left, and also are adherent to the crest of the ventricular septum, effectively closing the interventricular communication. So again, no shunting available at the ventricular level, only at the arterial level. The volume of this dysplastic left component of this truncal valve is most likely the cause of the aortic arch hypoplasia. So the volume of the valve has caused significant stenosis at the distal aspect of the left ventricular outflow tract. You've seen the variance, but you all know full well that in the majority of cases, there is the typical common arterial trunk in which the truncal valve guards that common ventricular arterial junction, but there is the potential for shunting both at arterial level and ventricular level. So now we're going to look at the variations you might find in your clinical practice. And the first thing we have to look at is the nature of that interventricular communication. You've already seen that Diane has described it in the heart she's demonstrated to you thus far, but we will repeat that very shortly. We're then going to look at the variation in terms of the commitment of the trunk the ventricular mass. You've also heard Diane describe to you how the common truncal valve can have various numbers of leaflets. Oftentimes those leaflets can be dysplastic. We've emphasized now that the way that we describe the intrapericardial pathways is on the basis of aortic as opposed to pulmonary dominance. For the surgeons, we need to know where the current arteries are. And we need to make note and take note of the sidedness of the aortic arch, and we need to consider patency of the arterial duct. So now we're going to look at all these variables, and Diane will illustrate again some of them to you. So we're going to start off by looking at the interventricular communication. Now, I call it an interventricular communication. Almost always, most of you will call this the ventricular septal defect. There's one additional variant I need to tell you about here because Diane's shown you a case in which the common truncal valve was divided into right and left ventricular parts. But in that instance, the raphe separating the two was attached to the crest of the ventricular septum so that shunting was only at arterial level. We know that very rarely, as in atrioventricular septal defect, that raphe can float. And whilst I was at Great Ormond Street, I worked with my colleagues and we described such a case. But these variants are exceedingly rare. So you know almost always there is a common ventricular arterial junction but then the ventricular, interventricular communication is usually described as the ventricular septal defect. So here's the situation. You see that the overall ventricular arterial defect has an aortic component with roofing the, the, with the uh, aortopulmonary septum, roofing the arterial component of the defect. And then we have the interventricular communication which is the cone of space subtended beneath the common truncal valve and the crest of the muscular ventricular septum. We discussed the significance of this in the setting of tetralogy. And as in tetralogy, the surgeon will put the aortic component of the defect into communication with the left ventricle. So he will, he or she will close 
the right ventricular margin of the cone of space subtended beneath the common truncal valve. So that is what we look at when we describe the ventricular septal defect. We would prefer to call it an interventricular communication. And here you see the two main variants, and Diane has already emphasized this. The defect is an outlet defect. It is opening to the right ventricle between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. There you see the septomarginal trabeculation or the septal band. In the majority of cases, there is a muscular postero inferior rim, and that protects the conduction axis. But on occasion, the infant ventricular infundibular fold can stop short of the caudal limb of the septomarginal trabeculation. So we have a perimembranous defect, and then the conduction tissue is potentially at risk in that posterior inferior margin of the defect. So Diane is now going to emphasize again the distinction between these two major types of interventricular communication or ventricular septal defect. The interventricular communication in this heart with a common arterial trunk extends to become perimembranous. Again, it is a juxta-arterial defect that is extending into the outlet component of the right ventricle between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. So here's the body of the septomarginal trabeculation and its caudal arm with the medial papillary muscle. The caudal arm does not reach the ventricular infundibular fold in this case, allowing for fibrous continuity between the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve along the posterior inferior border and as well fibrous continuity between the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve. So this defect is perimembranous and the surgeon will need to be very careful when placing sutures along its posterior inferior border so as not to damage the conduction tissue. The interventricular communication in hearts with a common arterial trunk is an outlet defect and it is juxta arterial. The defect lies between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation and in this particular case has muscular borders from the right ventricular side. Here the caudal arm of the septal band is joining with the ventricular infundibular fold in normal fashion and allowing the membranous septum to remain intact and protecting the conduction axis. We then need to remember that the interventricular communication is an outlet defect, but that can be confluent with the ventricular component of an atrioventricular septal defect, so that on occasion you see a situation like this. In this instance, the trunk is arising exclusively from the right ventricle, another of the variables. But there you see the leaflets of the atrioventricular valve are disappearing through the large defect. And that tells you that not only do we have a ventricular arterial defect, we also have an atrioventricular septal defect. And then when we look in the left ventricle, we see a trifoliate left atrioventricular valve. So remember, common arterial trunk can also be associated with common atrioventricular junction. But let's move on and let's look at some other of these variants. Origin from the ventricular mass. In the majority of the hearts that you've been looking at so far, there has been a balanced origin. But in some instances, as in the heart I just showed you with atrioventricular septal defect and common arterial trunk, the common trunk can arise exclusively from the right ventricle. On the other hand, it can arise exclusively from the left ventricle. That makes it easier for the surgeon because then he can close that existing channel between the right ventricle and the common trunk, of course, then reattaching pulmonary arteries to the, left, to the right ventricle 
And that is the essence of repair in all these instances. So when the trunk is arising from the left ventricle, it makes it that much easier. So, but usually this is what we have where the trunk is balanced between the ventricles. And so there again, you see the cone of space beneath the truncal valve and the crest of the muscular ventricular septum. But this is a variant in which there was a typical interventricular communication, but here the trunk is arising exclusively from the right ventricle. So now the interventricular communication is the outlet, the only outlet for the left ventricle. So now if it is restrictive, the surgeon will need to enlarge it before he can patch the defect or tunnel the defect to the overriding common ventricular arterial junction. And in this instance, the defect is perimembranous. So the area that might need to be enlarged is the anterocephalad margin of the defect, which is opening between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. But let's move on. The truncal root itself, in most instances, is trisinuate. You've seen examples of that. It can be quadrisinuate. You've seen that. And Diane's initial case had a bisinuate arterial root. So these are the variations for formation of the root and for formation of the valvar leaflets. Remember that those leaflets can be dysplastic, and you've seen that in several of the hearts that have been demonstrated already to you today. So let's come back to those intrapericardial arterial pathways. How should we describe them? I'm sure many of you still use the system that was described quite some time ago now by Collett and Edwards. And then the alternate variant is the alphanumeric classification prepared by Richard Van Prague. The potential problem there is that they use the same numbers, but they mean different things to different people. So what we have shown you today is that it is much easier to use a system that in fact was also initially proposed by Richard Van Prague. And that is the notion of aortic versus pulmonary dominance. We've already shown you that, but it is so important that we are going to repeat this again. And Diane is now going to show you again how we can consider the intrapericardial arterial pathways on the basis of aortic as opposed to pulmonary dominance. This specimen with a common arterial trunk has a very broad component of the common trunk as it exits the ventricular mass. Also, we see one of the associated abnormalities here where the aortic arch is extending to the right and there is mirror image branching of the brachiocephalic arteries. Looking inside of this common ventricular arterial junction, we see the pulmonary component arising very low within the common portion of the arterial trunk and associated with one of the valvar sinuses. The valve has three leaflets in this case, and the coronary artery arises in association with that low takeoff of the pulmonary arteries and adjacent to one of the commissures. So this can create significant problems for the surgeon when they're trying to relocate the pulmonary portion and they have to take great care not to damage the coronary circulation. The other coronary artery is at mid sinus and in a much better position than the left coronary orifice. The pulmonary arteries in this case are crossed so that the right pulmonary artery originates leftward and prior to the left pulmonary artery originating from the common trunk so that the right pulmonary artery originates here and extends behind the aorta to the right lung and then the left pulmonary artery arises and crosses it so that these are crossed pulmonary arteries and this is the typical appearance 
where they cross one another as they leave the arterial trunk to extend to the lungs. The interventricular communication is a perimembranous defect in this case. It is typical in that it is an outlet defect that is juxta-arterial and lies within the Y of the septomarginal trabeculation, or between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. This defect extends to become perimembranous, so here's the medial papillary muscle, and you can see that the caudal arm does not reach the ventriculo-infundibular fold and that the tricuspid valve is in fibrous continuity with the mitral valve along the posterior inferior aspect of the defect. This is a very interesting case that I found in a fetopsy from an intrauterine fetal demise at 15 weeks and we can see the heart lying within the chest in anatomic position with the lungs on either side and I folded back the right atrial appendage so that we can see the common arterial trunk as it exits the ventricular mass. This is a pulmonary dominant common arterial trunk and the patterning of the separate channels depends on the extent of the aorta pulmonary septum during development. So here we can see the smaller aortic component arising from the common trunk and branching to the left carotid, the brachiocephalic trunk, which then branches to the right carotid and the right subclavian. The pulmonary component is dominant and gives rise to a patent arterial duct that supplies the descending aorta. This aortic arch extends to the left, and here we can see the left subclavian artery arising distal to the interrupted aortic arch. An interrupted aortic arch or coarctation is common with pulmonary dominant common arterial trunks. The pulmonary arteries are very tiny, but there is the left and there is the right, and you can see that they're bifurcating separately from the posterior lateral aspect of the common or the pulmonary component of the common arterial trunk. The aortic component arises in this area. So that the ventriculo arterial communication extends from the origin of the aorta to the crest of the ventricular septum. The ventricular septal defect in this case is entirely muscular. The arterial trunk is supported by a complete subarterial muscular infundibulum so that this common arterial trunk is mostly committed to the right ventricle. Also interesting in this case there was an absent truncal valve. This is quite rare and probably the reason that we don't see this defect in live-born patients because they don't make it to uh, complete gestation. This case also had a single coronary artery, which you can barely see right there. So now you've seen that when we have pulmonary dominance, typically the aortic arch is interrupted or it's narrowed. There are other things you need to know about the aortic arch. It is right-sided in about a third of the patients. And as I say, anticipate interruption or coarctation whenever there is pulmonary dominance. But when it is interrupted, then the arterial duct becomes part of the circulation. So pulmonary dominance again, you're, going to, you're always going to find an arterial duct. You can also find the arterial duct when we have aortic dominance, but the pulmonary arteries are discontinuous. And this is one of the variants that is emphasized in the categorization proposed by Dr. Van Prague, in which the left pulmonary artery arises from an arterial duct, or the right pulmonary artery arises from an arterial duct. Very rarely, however, you can have an arterial duct when the intrapericardial pathways themselves are balanced. And this is one of those rare variants. There you see the aorta, 
it's the same size as the pulmonary trunk and they are separated within the pericardial cavity, but still there is an arterial duct. This is unusual. It is rare to find an arterial duct when there is either aortic dominance unless there are discontinuous pulmonary arteries or unless, as you see here, there is balance between the intrapericardial arterial pathways. Now let's come back to the third part of the circulation. As we remember, a common arterial trunk is defined on the basis that it supplies directly the systemic, the pulmonary, and the coronary arterial pathways. The potential problem for describing the coronary arteries is there is no distinctive pattern. Oftentimes, they take their origin above the sinutubular junction. You need to be particularly care, take particular care in describing the arteries when the pulmonary arteries themselves take origin within a truncal valvar sinus. We've already looked at this specimen that has crossed pulmonary arteries arising from the common arterial trunk. The pulmonary component arises from within a common truncal valvar sinus, as does the left coronary orifice. So the surgeon has a quite difficult task with repairing these specimens that have sinusal origin of the pulmonary arteries, especially when they're associated with sinusal origin of the coronary artery from that same sinus. I have a second specimen with a similar relationship. So this also has crossed pulmonary arteries and shows nicely how the right pulmonary artery originates leftward from the left pulmonary artery and they cross one another as they extend to the right and left lungs. If we look at the right side of this common arterial trunk, it, it has been windowed and we can see that the crossed pulmonary arteries also have sinusal origin in this case. The left coronary orifice is in close approximation to that sinusal origin of the pulmonary arteries and as well lies just above a commissure. The circumflex coronary artery in this case also arises from the right coronary artery. So here's the right coronary artery within the right atrioventricular groove. And then extending posterior to the common arterial trunk is the circumflex coronary artery. So this just shows us that with common arterial trunk, we can have many associated coronary anomalies. So what we have described for you is the variations to be found in the setting of a common arterial trunk. We then need to remember that on occasion the common arterial trunk can look like other things. So we need to distinguish a common arterial trunk, solitary trunk. We need to make the separation from aortopulmonary window when there is a communication between the intrapericardial arterial pathways and we also need to think about aortic origin of one pulmonary artery. So what is a solitary arterial trunk and how does it differ from a common arterial trunk? Well, I'm showing you that in this picture that shows you the origin of the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries. Because if those intrapericardial pulmonary arteries are, had they been present, you would not know from where they would have risen. If the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries arise from the heart, then obviously the arterial trunk that arises from the heart is an aorta. But it is possible very rarely to have atretic intrapericardial pulmonary arteries arising from the vessel that itself takes origin from the heart. And this makes it a common arterial trunk with pulmonary atresia. So in the absence of intrapericardial pulmonary arteries, the best we can do is describe a solitary arterial trunk, recognizing, of course, that that trunk will be functioning as an aorta.
So what is aortopulmonary window? The aortopulmonary window is failure to close the embryonic aortopulmonary foramen. So the essence of the aortopulmonary window is separate aortic and pulmonary roots, but with persistence of that embryonic aortopulmonary foramen. And then we must distinguish that from the very rare finding that you've seen now, persistence of the arterial component of the ventricular arterial defect, because then we truly have a common ventricular arterial junction, but it is separated into separate orifices for the right left ventricles. And you've seen that today in the beautiful example shown to you by Diane. And then we must also think about aortic origin of the right pulmonary artery. In this setting, the left pulmonary artery arises from the right ventricle, and it is doing so through a subpulmonary infundibulum. So this is not a common ventricular arterial junction. So please do not call origin of the left pulmonary or origin of the right pulmonary artery from the aorta. Please do not call it hemitruncus, because the essence of what we are talking about, and what many of you still think of as truncus, is the commonality of the ventricular arterial junction. So if we wrap everything up, that is the take home message. Phenotypic feature of all the hearts we've been discussing today is the commonality of the ventricular arterial junction. And what we've tried to show you is that that common valve, that common ventricular arterial valve is guarding a ventricular arterial defect that has arterial and ventricular components. What I hope we've also shown you is that when you're thinking of a simple way to distinguish the arrangement of the intrapericardial arterial pathways, that is best done on the basis of aortic and pulmonary dominance. But Diane has also shown you the need to take note of other features that are not to be found in the categorizations of Collette and Edwards, nor my very good friend Richard Van Prague, and that is such things as sinusal origin the pulmonary component or crossing of the origin of the right and left pulmonary arteries. And that is why, most importantly, we should be distinguishing between aortic and pulmonary dominance. It is a simple way of approaching things, but then with separate descript description of the arrangement of the pulmonary and systemic components of the intrapericardial arterial pathways. But again, the major feature. The phenotypic feature of the lesions we've been discussing is the commonality of the ventricular arterial junction. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. It was really good. Um, as usual, very, very good uh, presentation to all of us. Uh, sorry for that, guys. Okay, uh, Adrian has some um, specimens to show us, but first I want uh, to ask Dr. Norm Norman Silverman to give his uh, inputs about this presentation because I know that unfortunately he has to live. And after Dr. Norman, we are going to go to Adrian for him to show his specimens. And after that, we are going to open for this amazing panel to discuss this very interesting topic. Norman. Well, I, mean, I think uh, that, uh, again, this was a sobering uh, uh, new novel approach to think of the common arterial trunk in the light of a common atrioventricular junction. Uh, and I think that when you think about that, you then will describe the components of the defect as the interventricular, the valvar, and the supravalvar relationships that... Uh, has been so beautifully described. The other issue here that I think is really important is the fact that as an echocardiographer, one has to look carefully at these uh, coronary arteries. And as we've seen, they have a lot of similarity to the intramural coronary arteries that we see in normal situations without common arterial trunk in that they are high, they are related more to the annulus or to the arterial attachment, 
And as an echocardiographer, we have noted that many of these have an intramural course. And I don't know that, um, that this has been adequately addressed um, surgically. Bob, perhaps you can tell us. But uh, there is a, an incidence of sudden uh, death after truncus repair. And some of these patients in my series have had intramural coronary arteries as well. So I think that's an important issue. And lastly, Bob, um, I, for, for my, uh, not for my perspective, but for the panel, we notice a little ridge of tissue, which we call the aortopulmonary ridge, lying between the origins of the pulmonary artery and the, uh, uh, the aorta. That is not, as you have explained to me, the primitive persistent aorta pulmonary septum. Can you tell us what the origin is, of this it is? It is. is? No, that is the primitive aorta. I, don't, I hope I didn't explain that to you because that's what it is. So the, the, the area that separates the origin of the pulmonary component and the aortic component of the trunk is the aorto pulmonary septum, but that is separate from the, the entities that divide the arterial roots, the ventricular output tracts, because they are the cushions. And the essence of common arterial trunk is that the cushions have not fused. So that's why they form a common trunkal valve. But the aortopulmonary septum can fuse. And as you say, that is what separates the interpericardial component of the aorta from the interpericardial components of the pulmonary trunk. And what I realized today and, and watching Diane's exquisite presentations, when you have sinusal origin of that pulmonary component, in fact, the aortopulmonary septum is very well formed and it's grown all the way down nearly to the level of the sinutubular junction. And that is another very important variant that I only fully appreciated seeing Diane's beautiful presentations today. Well, thank you very much for that, Bob. It's very helpful. You know, I unfortunately have another meeting that I have to attend, so I'm going to have to look at this on the video. Just, just before you go, can just and because the point you made about the intramural low, uh, uh, origin of the coronary arteries, I think that is a very important point that you made, and you say you have noted that in your echocardiographic studies. Exactly. But you've not, you've not, you, I don't, to correct me if I'm wrong, you've never published that. Well, I published it in our uh, communication, the, the, uh, the, the um, uh, congenital anomaly uh, um, um, app that you and I have uh, associated with. And there are numerous examples of this. Uh, and uh, I, I think that this uh, is always uh, a suspicion when the coronary artery orifice is ectopic, particularly high, as uh, is described by uh, Aphrodite Tsifa and uh, in your paper on this as well. So I think that coronary anomalies uh, are, are uh, from uh, Cora Len Lennox's study and, and others, but between one in, one in five patients with common arterial trunk has a coronary artery anomaly. And in fact, it may even be higher. Well, the problem that you raise there is that to a certain extent, they're all anomalous because we don't have the same landmarks as yes. when we have the author. And so we can't relate them in the fashion that we do when we have a common trunkal valve. So you, that, that's the point I tried to make, that there are no specific landmarks. But the point, what you made about the high origin is particularly true. Because I think in common arterial trunk, it's particularly frequent to find high origin or to find origin adjacent to a commissure. Right. And as you well know, it's, a, it's when the origin of the coronary artery is adjacent to the commissure, in addition to high origin, that you get those intramural variants. So I think that right. that is very important. But in fact, you mentioned also the study that Cora did on the coronary arteries. That was whilst Diane was still in her formative years at Pittsburgh. And I think Diane did all the beautiful dissections in that initial paper. And I think, did, Diane, you were, part, you were co author on that paper with Cora, were you not? Yeah. Yes, I was. I have I, to go, Bob. I'm so sorry. Thank you very you much. Have to go.
Bye, Norman. Well, maybe, maybe we'll, you, we'll Norman. let you go, Norman. And uh, Diane, you can tell us about that paper. Yeah, we looked at all of the common arterial trunks in the Pittsburgh collection, and I actually just uh, secondary to COVID and having more time, I threw away all those drawings that, that I did initially <laughs> from Pittsburgh. So it was a uh, it was a, a really uh, fun and interesting paper to do. And um, as you know, I, I love doing the dissections. So I'll have to pull it out and read it again. Or maybe we should start again, because I think the point that Norman has made, and I mean, Q, you can comment on this. I mean, are surgeons aware of the intramural nature of the coronary arteries in the setting of common arterial trunk? Well, you know, I think one of the main, uh, you know, important, you know, activities we do when we open up the, 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 the trunk, we really have to carefully define the osteums of all the coronaries because like you say, there's great variability. And when you transect the pulmonary artery uh, trunk off, I mean, you have to take into account, okay, I have to close that. And when I close it, either I do it primarily or with a patch, I can't encumber or put traction on a nearby left main. So, so you have to kind of adjust where you do your transection based on you know, the proximity of that cork, uh, that orifice. If you distort, injure uh, that left main, that, that's probably a, a lethal move for that, for that patient. So it's critically important. But I think we just know there's not a, you know, there's abnormalities are more common than not. And we just have to just, you know, make our uh, incisions accordingly. Uh, so. Yeah, actually in the paper from Pittsburgh, we looked at all the surgical repairs of the common arterial trunks as well. And I can't remember how many we found, but there were some that were injured, um, secondary surgery. So I'll have to go back and look at that. But I mean, uh, that was a long time ago, was it not? What, 80, yeah. 86 or something like that? Yeah, probably. So I think things have moved on since then. <laughs> hey, it's Gil Wernofsky. I just wanted to uh, tell you about a clinical case we've seen recently, and I don't know if anyone on the panel has seen this, but the origin of one of the coronaries, I forget exactly which one, came from the junction of the main uh, so-called pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. So that, I don't know if you've seen that, Jim, when you open up the, the window, so to speak, there can, there can be coronaries that don't even come from the sinuses, so to speak. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of the specimens that anyone has seen has shown that, but it's a, uh, uh, it was, as you might imagine, a lethal problem uh, because it was, it was detected after uh, detachment from the MPA. Yeah. No, I have not seen that particular variant, Gil, but I think that just makes the point that you have to be, you know, you have to, you know, you know, look three times and cut once, you know, when you when you're dealing with these kids, because these we're talking about millimeters or less of, especially you know, in our neonates as we're doing trunk is now, you know, a neonatal period. These are really, really you know, tight quarters down there, so very, very important. Are there ever problems with distal coronary arteries? You mentioned the variability in the proximal coronary arteries. Are there problems distally as well? A good question. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Uh, I've seen a right coronary artery arising from the pulmonary trunk in an AP window. Well, in fact, that's frequent in the setting of AP window. As you know, that's one of the frequent associations is that uh, pulmonary origin of the coronary arteries. But I'm not sure we've looked at the distal coronary arteries in the setting of common trunk. I mean, you already showed today that very nice example of the circumflex taking a, a retro truncal pathway and arising from the right from the right coronary. That's the first time I've seen that variant. Just one more question, Bob, for you. Type, you used to talk about type four truncus, which of course you get rid of with these alphanumeric classifications, which you hate so much. How can you tell that from pulmonary atresia and mapcas? Well, you can't. I mean, and that's the point I tried to make when I said that simply for uniformity, I would call that a solitary arterial trunk. But uh, it isn't a, you, 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 you don't know. And that's the point I was trying to make. Had the pulmonary arteries, had the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries developed, would they have originated from the common trunk or would they have originated from the heart? And since then, that they're not there, we don't okay. know. So for purity, that's why I would call it the solitary trunk. But the point you make 
is essentially it's functioning as an aorta. It's not, we can't call it a common trunk because the trunk is not supplying the pulmonary circulation. The pulmonary circulation is coming from major aortopulmonary collateral arteries. And it's one of those incomprehensible situations that you can cater for by having a nomenclature that makes sense, but to all intents and purposes, that trunk is an aorta, is it not, rather than a common mm -hmm. trunk? Sure. I Adrian. think Adrian has, has some uh, specimens to show us today, Adrian. Thank yes. you for joining. Thank you again, and I'll be very short because I think in this specimen that you can see here, I can show a few things. First of all, um, as you see here is the aortic component and the pulmonary component, they look pretty balanced. We can notice also the common origin of the brachiocephalic trunk and the left carotid. So we have to keep an eye open about the anomalies in the arch. Um, there is a remnant of the uh, arterial duct here, which is partially torn. A high origin of the coronary artery, as you see here, are the truncal leaflets, but here is the origin of the coronary. And interestingly, when I turn here and show the origin of the pulmonary branches, you can see the left is here and the right is here. What is interesting is that there is a ridge, there is a ridge between them. And we struggle with this ridge, even if we try to get a very nice um, part of the origin of the common origin of these pulmonary arteries, because that ridge becomes stenotic in time. And it is between, is not necessarily between the pulmonary arteries and the aortic component, is in between the pulmonary arteries. And we struggle with that ridge here. But again, I just wanted to, to show this. And then moving down to the interventricular communication, it's not always easy to judge whether it's restrictive or not when looking at the entire um, common arteri um, the ventricular arterial junction, because for example, in this case, if we think of septating and putting the patches to um, direct the um, aorta, the main the aortic component of the trunk towards the left ventricle that is there, we may not be able to always be sure that the ventricular septal defect is adequate in size. Moreover, we discussed about the aortic and pulmonary uh, balance. We discussed about how the common ventricular arterial junctions originates from the ventricle. We also have to think of how balanced is, are the ventricles in the uh, ventricular mass. Because look at this specimen, for example. We see that the anterior interventricular artery is here, but the actual right ventricular mass is not that large. And if we have to put a patch that will take the aorta towards the left ventricle, if we have to do a further incision to connect the pulmonary arteries into the right ventricle, we have to think what's left of that right ventricle after the septation. And it's not always an easy um, assessment. And even the coronary arteries on the outside of the heart might not always be helpful. And lastly, in this interventricular communication, the truncal leaflet is in continuity with the mitral leaflet, if you see fibrous continuity on the back. And we also have to think of how we describe the infundibulum in this, um, in this heart. And the other specimen is I, I, just- I bring that one yeah. back just a moment. Sure, sure. Can you bring, us that, can you bring me that one back? Just show us the, the uh, arterial component of the defect. Open it up and show us where the aorta and the pulmonary trunk have their uh, yeah. are so separated. In a moment. As you see here. Yep, yeah, this is this is the aortic component. Yeah, here. Yeah. And this is the pulmonary component. So there's not much aortopulmonary septum, in fact. There's not quite a, here. there's an extensive uh, arterial component there. Yeah, the aortopulmonary septum, it's here. Beautiful. Because this is the aorta, and these are the two pulmonary arteries, as you see here. But we have to remember the ridge in between these two pulmonary arteries that um, sometimes it's, it's a problem uh, after, after correction. And I just wanted to show this specimen. Uh, it is a common arterial trunk. So I'm looking at the specimen again from 
an attitudinally correct position. Here is the common arterial trunk. The pulmonary arteries come from this arterial trunk. I have, there is one here going to the left. And then there is another one that goes to the right. But what I wanted to show you is that when we look from the right atrium, this is the morphologic right atrium, and we look from the left atrium, which is, as you see here, it's a morphologic left atrium. And if I open the heart in a clamshell situation, we are in a situation of a double inlet ventricle. I would call it left ventricle because both both atrioventricular valves come into this ventricle. And we've done here a few sections in order to find another small ventricle anteriorly. We are not able to find any. So this is a double inlet to a ventricle. Most likely it's a left ventricle with a common arterial trunk. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And why if you can't remember- it be an indeterminate ventricle? No, I think, I think when we look at this in the past, we said that this is a left ventricle actually, uh, but I, I, I think this heart will benefit from a micro CT study. Indeed. Also to, to look where is the conduction in, in, yes, the, in a heart. Good question. Yeah. We have to find a septum first. Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, I only had these two hearts. Thank you very much. Well, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. It was very good. We have a few questions, but I think first I'd like to listen what the panelists has to, to say about all of these amazing uh, topics that we covered today. Alan, do you want to start? Well, I mean, it's as I think as Norman said, it's nice to have the similar concept between this condition and uh, atrioventricular septal defect. It helps to understand it. Um, but we've been beset with these uh, alphanumeric classifications. I keep getting them mixed up. I can never remember which, for example, A, B, or C for the aortic interruption. I never remember. It's easier to describe what you actually see. I think that's a better system. Most of the trunks I've ever seen have been type one and a half, which is in between <laughs> type one and two, I suppose. Most of the ones I've seen. I think from a clinical point of view, the issue we used to have was when to operate. And I think that because sometimes the pulmonary resistance falls precipitously and you've been a rock on a hard place, you know, you might have a higher resistance and suddenly it, they start to steal when the resistance falls precipitously. So we ended up trying to operate in these kids quite early on to prevent that happening. But um, the big issue, of course, then was how do you connect the heart to the pulmonary arteries? That was always a problem. What do you put in there? Um, but it was a very nice presentation. Maybe Q can come in and comment on that, because I think you make some very good points there. I mean, the Q, you must have seen during your uh, career how things have changed with the timing and the results of, uh, of uh, surgery for common arterial trunk. You know, I, I would agree. I mean, when we used to wait, sometimes patients would go home and come back, you know, at a month or two of age. Um, and I think we, we had more... Uh, you know, changes in the pulmonary vasculature and, and episodes of pulmonary hypertensive crisis in the post-operative period because we allow that secondary pathology to occur. So I think now we're more comfortable in the first week or one week to two weeks of, of age to do the primary the primary surgery. We'll use, um, you know, all our neonatal techniques. We'll uh, use an eight or nine millimeter uh, pulmonary homograph kind of works well to do the RV to pulmonary artery reconstruction. And I think our post-operative morbidity is less by intervening early and, and just not allowing the secondary changes to progress too much. I also note that Gil has found his congenital heart academy background. So I, we <laughs> might have to do I feel like I'm wearing the company shirt now. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, you haven't got a tie on, have you? <laughs> Look at that. Um, I, How very um, English. I would, I think I would say, uh, first of all, I completely agree with Alan. I, I, I can never remember in this, in coronary classifications for transposition and tricuspid atresia, all of those numbers and A's and B's and all that stuff. It's just better to describe what you see. And 
I feel that's particularly important when I work with our surgical staff. Um, I completely agree with Q also that um, that the um, the the, rep the the post-operative course is not easy, but it is so much smoother than when we used to bring these patients in earlier. And even if they go home, it's unlikely that they get any bigger. Um, maybe the renal function gets a little bit better, but the brain probably doesn't grow as in transposition. The uh, lungs get vascular disease. So yeah, we tend to do these in the first week, maybe the first open OR slot really. Um, and uh, we will generally, our surgeons, I don't know if Jim, if that's your usual practice, but uh, our surgeons, especially for neonatal tets, neonatal truncuses, will leave a foramen open, which I also uh, think is very, very helpful given the restrictive physiology of the right ventricle. Uh, so a cardiac output can be preserved. Um, so I really don't have too much more to say. I love the description of the, um, I think you called it the cone of space, um, which I love that term. I actually had one question, if you don't mind, and that is there is um, not a lot of clinical similarities. And in fact, in the old classification schemes of cyanotic versus acyanotic and pulmonary blood flow and whatnot, tetralogy of flow, truncus, uh, common arterial trunk, and uh, AS, uh, VSDs with some posterior malalignment um, and coarctation or interrupted aortic arch would be in very different classifications. But it, as we look at the development of the ventriculoarterial arterial arrangement um, and the association of those three lesions with microdeletion of the 22nd chromosome, they seem, they seem more like cousins to each other than we originally thought. Um, Bob, Diane, anyone want to comment on the way that that looks and that sort of association uh, and what might be an embryologic similarity? Uh, in that oh, I think you're right. I think you're 100 percent correct about the background, because these are the so-called uh, neural crestopathies. And I think they all the tetralogy, common arterial trunk, as you say, the uh, interruption of the aortic arch with caudal deviation of the muscular outlet septum. I think they share the genetic background. And I, as we delve more into this, I'm sure you're going to be correct there. And I think they do all uh, devolve upon problems in the migration of the neural crest. I mean, as yet, I mean, there obviously has to be a similarity between tetralogy and common arterial trunk. The difference being that in tetralogy, the cushions have fused, but they fused in an anomalous position, right. whereas in uh, common arterial trunk, they haven't fused. And then you've got the counterpart of that, which was the other one you mentioned, interruption of the caudal deviation of the outlet septum. Again, the cushions are fused, but you could look at that as the counterpart of tetralogy. Right. Tetralogy has anterocephalar deviation of the outlet septum, interruption with uh, has caudal deviation of the outlet septum. So I'm sure the more we learn about this and the genetic background, we're going to get a much better idea of what's going on, which is why I like to think of all of these now as outro tract malformations. I think the conotruncal business, it doesn't help us because sitting in the middle of all of this is the arterial roots. So bicuspid aortic valve, for sh how, how can that not be a conotruncal malformation when it's sitting right in the middle? So my, mm -hmm. my current, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? My, uh, what I wish to focus on is we should be talking about outflow tract malformations rather than conotruncal malformations. All right, thank you. Uh, the last thing I'll add to that, and we'll go to the rest of the panel, is um, at our center from a, a clinically, if we see either of those three lesions, tetralogy, common arterial trunk, and interrupting the aortic arch, it's standard practice to screen for 22Q deletion with whatever technique you use. Uh, as well as uh, evaluate the baby for all the other organ systems, especially the brain. Thanks for letting me uh, share that. No, it's, we're, we're, we're happy to have you with us. We like the background. I'm the more impressed you've got a tie on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know that, that Dr. <laughs> that, uh, Dr. Allen doesn't have his tie on. Well, I don't to wear ties anymore. I don't, I don't, I couldn't agree more, Alan, but I'm on service, so I have to look like a physician. <laughs> it, I thought it ties with germ collectors and physicians these days. <laughs> All right.
It's also nice to see Diane again and Jim. Hey guys. <laughs> Good to see y'all. Yes. Okay. Anyone in the Sasha panel? Sasha has been very comments? quiet. Where's Are... Sasha? Does, is Sasha still with us, Grace? No, no. Sasha had to leave. He has an emergency. Ah. That's okay, you're in charge. We have a couple of uh, clinical, more than a couple of clinical uh, people in the panel. I'd like to mention that repairing a common arterial trunk is still a very difficult feat. In, and I, we have participants from many countries where small homographs are not available. Yeah. Good so point. I would like to rediscuss the possibility of palliation for these patients and whether you consider using a restrictive RV to PA conduit, for example, leaving the VSD open, dealing probably with the arch in these patients who sometimes have comorbidities or uh, low weight. What, what do you think? Sometimes they are so small that you have to bend. It's, it's difficult to do total repair in a 1.8, two kilograms baby. Sometimes that you have to do watch very closely. And uh, sometimes you keep this patient admitted or sometimes you discharge in home, but with a, a close follow-up in the clinic like uh, every week. And then you try to do the surgery as soon as possible. But sometimes you have to palliate, I agree. Would, uh, would Q contemplate palliation in this day and age? No, I think if we had some strong contraindications to repair extreme prematurity, you know, CNS hemorrhage, for example, something like that, I think bilateral pulmonary bands is a good way to, to palliate, you know, for some period, you know, three, six months or so. Um, but in the so bad old days, it was exceedingly difficult to put bilateral pulmonary bands on, was it not? I noticed that in the current uh, issue of the World Journal, there is the stat paper that Marshall Jacobs and his colleagues have produced in which pulmonary arterial banding is now a stat for procedure. Right. I, I think we've learned a lot about being able to do that in tiny babies, you know, as we've done, you know, some high, more, had more experience with hybrids and things like that. I think we, we're, we're better at it, uh, but it's, it's a tricky. Yeah, endeavor. great cue that's, there was a question from an anonymous attendee that I answered in the Q&A box about a, a baby that's two kilos and uh, that, you know, where exactly that lower limit is, uh, I think depends on your resources, your unit's experience uh, and the type of RV to PA connection you have available to you. Um, if there are not small pulmonary homographs, we've had some increasing use of saphenous vein homographs. Uh, that can be used from the RV to the PA at times, the small Gore-Tex shunts, the, it would be the equivalent of, a, of an RV to PA conduit as used in Sano's modification of the Norwood operation. I, I like the idea of making it restrictive. And then the next operation, you already have the target for the proximal new RV to PA conduit when the VSD gets closed. Um, but, but Adrian, as you're saying, it's not, it's not a straightforward decision. Um, and it's uh, the overlay of resources and experience plays a part in that as well. I agree. Very nice. I think we can move forward for a uh, uh, some questions from the uh, Q&A chat box. And guys, if you have more questions, please uh, uh, let us know. Uh, we have more maybe 15 minutes to, to continue that. It's been an amazing session. And we are very glad that this session has been a, a such a successful and uh, long because we have a lot to learn. So there's one question from Jason Tan. He's saying, for the solitary arterial trunk, are the pulmonary arteries morphologically similar to those that arise from the common arterial trunk? Absolutely not. I mean, the whole point of the solitary arterial trunk is that there are no intrapericardial pulmonary arteries. So this is the variant in tetralogy with pulmonary atresia, where you have exclusively systemic, uh, uh, systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries, and there is nothing within the pericardial cavity that is feeding the pulmonary circulation. So the problem, that, that's why we call it a solitary arterial trunk. There are no intrapericardial pulmonary arteries. Okay. Bob, do you know if microscopically they're the same or do they look a little bit more like aortopulmonary collaterals? Now that's a very good question because of course, once the, uh, once the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries get into the lungs, then they are pulmonary arteries. And this is why I have a problem when people talk about native pulmonary arteries. Because once you, once you get in the lung, 
they are pulmonary arteries. The, the difference is that they are fed from the descending aorta rather than from the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries. I, I don't have the expertise to tell you whether they initially have a different structure, but I would imagine since of necessity, they're receiving their blood at, arterial, at, uh, at systemic levels, I would imagine that they're going to have a different structure uh, postnatally. But as I say that, I don't have the expertise to give you a good, a good answer there. I think they might behave differently in terms of, and unlike MAPCUS, which tend to stenose, you may have unprotected distal, distal pressures. You might be very high, I, I, I guess. I've seen that once. Okay, there we are had a similar question Sorry. regarding uh, origin of the right pulmonary artery from the ascending aorta, whether it comes through a duct or it's a direct origin from, from that. And we, we, we struggle to understand whether it's, um, well, it's origin is direct. Well, there's no question that when the, uh, when the right pulmonary artery comes from the ascending aorta, uh, it does so at the margins of the pericardial cavity, and without question, that is not ductal origin of the right pulmonary artery. So we would distinguish between origin of the right pulmonary artery from the ascending aorta and discontinuous pulmonary arteries with ductal origin of the right pulmonary artery. That's a totally different entity. There are a couple of questions asking you to please uh, say more about the concept that is not the definition that we don't use anymore of the emitruncus. So why it's not an emitruncus and what, how should we name it? Well, this comes back to the definition of what is a common, well, this is why we should get away for, for starters. We should stop talking about truncus at all because it's not a truncus, it's, it's a common arterial trunk. And if you have the right pulmonary artery arising from the infundibulum, also the left pulmonary artery arising from the infundibulum, the right pulmonary artery ascending, arising from the ascending aorta, then that does not have a common arterial trunk. So it can't be a half common arterial trunk, QED. I mean, it's a, it's a simple matter of logic, which is why we should not only kick out hemitruncus, we should also kick out truncus and we should all be calling it common arterial trunk. Now, hemitruncus is also a Greek Latin merger, which usually is not a particularly <laughs> good one. An even better reason for doing away with it. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> And we have a couple of questions about the crossed uh, uh, pulmonary arteries. So one of them is, is there any stenosis commonly on these branches? And the other is that a surgical, so our surgeons uh, on the panel could ask, uh, answer that if we need to uncross them for the correction. Uh, I would say it's common to have a rotation of the, of the, of the right and left branches to, and, and it's variable degree. And I think it's really important to, to maintain that geometry when you reconstruct with a conduit, because if you try to uncross them, I think you'd get, you know, torsion, angulation, and, and, and stenosis. So we try to just leave it in, in, a, in the same relative orientation once we connect the conduit. The fascinating thing about cross pulmonary arteries is that they were described quite a long time ago. I mean, my very good friend and colleague, Anton Becker, described cross pulmonary arteries in the setting of common arterial trunk when he was working in the late 1960s with Jesse Edwards. And then they were also described in the setting of the pulmonary artery itself with separate arterial roots. But the surprising thing is that they've received relatively little attention in the categorizations of common arterial trunk. And yet, as we now look at more and more of them, we see these cross pulmonary arteries all the time. I mean, Adrian showed us a case, Diane has shown us two cases. I mean, Q, how often have you seen cross pulmonary arteries? I, I say commonly. I mean, uh, that, I think that's, that's relatively common. It's the, it's, the, it's the takeoff that just seems like they're, they're rotated around each other. And I think you just have to respect that rotation so you don't create a problem. So the surprising thing for me is that in the original categorizations, I mean, we did one ourselves. I did a categorization of common arterial trunk in 74 with Giancarlo Krupi. That Giancarlo was the first fellow I ever had who came and spent a year with me in London. 
We looked at common arterial trunk and we didn't notice cross pulmonary arteries at that time. I don't know why we didn't spot them. Well, I wonder if the non-perfused state, you know, as an anatomic specimen, it may not be that obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Who has found that? That's a lovely picture. Oh, Bob, goodness. I don't know if you want to describe this picture. <laughs> <laughs> this is Anton Becker and myself. And this was when we were at Duke University in 1975. And they took us to this beautiful river. We had a wonderful time. I mean, that was when North Carolina was a dry state. <laughs> and they welcomed us at the airport and they said, we've got bad news for you guys. North Carolina is a dry state. And we were pissed every night that we were there. Well, since you commented on my tie, I wanted to comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> You all note that at that stage I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do anything these days, Gil. You have all my secrets. <laughs> now, Wernowski has more pictures of more people. I mean, it's it's dangerous. Genital <laughs> <laughs> Heart Academy was a silver lining. I'm beginning to wonder whether that was in fact the, the case. When, <laughs> what we might expect next week. <laughs> Guys, it was really an amazing session. Thank you all very much. I hope you all join us on Monday with Dr. Silverman. And then next Friday, we are going to have a very nice discussion with Dr. Anderson and this amazing panel. Please join us. Please share this video on YouTube to your colleagues if you found this interesting. And thank you very much for joining us. And thank you all, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>